Marinero, the sick podcast. We're talking football today, and what a pleasure it is to talk football. We bring in for the very first time on the sick podcast. She's a sports anchor and reporter with the NFL Network, Taylor Bishotti. Good afternoon. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm You're so very... honored to be invited onto the onto the podcast. Well, it's uh, it's our honor to have you today. You're one of our favorites, Bishotti. Italian, it correct? I know. I was just telling you off air. It's not the cookie, unfortunately. Uh, Although I do love biscottis, so. <laughs> so bisciotti, like where are those? After the cookie. Where are those Italian <laughs> origins? Would you know? I really don't know. I've ne- okay. shockingly enough, I've never been to Italy. I'm dying to go. Wow. Uh, my dad is his father is originally from Italy. Uh, now, and then my mom is Swedish, so like two polar opposites. I got it. I got it. Now, you were born and raised in Atlanta. Is that correct? I or? was, yeah. All right. Okay. So how was it being born and raised in Atlanta? It was good. It was yeah. It was great. I loved it. Um, I then went to Georgia, which is a big SEC football school. So I feel like I always was kind of raised around football. As you know, in the South, like college football is life if you're not like watching every sec game on saturdays i don't know what else you would be doing so it was fun to kind of grow up in a town that did appreciate like college football so much and then obviously i grew up in a family that loves the nfl so i felt like my weekends were always pretty filled with football (laughs) now i'm in montreal unfortunately we don't have a team in the nfl we do have a team in the canadian football league and i've been to many games in the united states uh nfl games but i've never been to a college game And I have buddies who have gone and they've gone to some games that have 100,000 people. Are they as good as my buddies say they are? Yes. It's so hard to even compare like college football, especially SEC football to NFL games, tailgates and like their parties around it. Because literally in like the SEC, like towns shut down, like Mm -hmm. Alabama, Ole Miss, Georgia, like Athens, like literally streets shut down everybody's outside by 9 a.m. It doesn't matter if it's a night game or if it's an afternoon game. People are out there early. Even if you're not going into the game, everyone around it has like a tailgate. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a sport in itself, yeah. just tailgating and like how diehard these fans are. So it's hard to even compare like NFL fans to college football fans. They're all great, yeah. but college seems to take it to another level. So I already have an assignment for us. We're going to go to a college football game this, this next <laughs> season. Once everybody gets vaccinated, uh, that would be awesome. Listen, I got to tell you that, uh, I'm a fan of all sports. Um, and, uh, I, I particularly fell in love with basketball over the past couple of years. I just think the, uh, uh the, 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 the game experience is really amazing, but I will yeah. say this, like the tailgating with the NFL, like no league has that. And that you said is a sport in itself. It's an event. It's a party. It's a happening. Um, no one has that. No one can replicate that. And um, that's just, it's such a big part of football, I think, is the tailgating as well. It's amazing. It's always neat to go to the different stadiums and the different yeah. towns and just see how differently like everybody does it. You know, Lambeau and like Green Bay just has their own traditions. And then Bill's mafia. I mean, you see them like lighting tables on fire outside of their tailgates. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone does it so differently, but there is like a different quirk or a different kind of theme to each tailgate and each like yeah. fan base. So it's always fun to go see the towns like that. You know, the terrible towels in Pittsburgh, the, you know, the black hole with old now Las Vegas Raiders. Yeah. She's Taylor Bishotti. I'm Marinero. It's the Sick Podcast. It's brought to you by my bookie. Use code SICKPICKS for a 50% deposit bonus. Bet, win, get paid. I want to get to your favorite city and your favorite, and your favorite tailgate in just a second here. But before I do, I, I know you said I grew up in a football family. Did you love football because you love football? Was it love at first sight or was it kind of like forced onto you? And then with time, you fell in love with it. How did it go down? I think it was a mix. I think that I grew up always loving college football just because I did grow up in Atlanta and, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody is very into college football there. Um, But then I also grew up with an older brother and then I had all older boy cousins on my dad's side of the family. So every like family vacation, it was me who's already the youngest one. So I'm already at a disadvantage. And then I'm hanging out with all older guys older boys. And so the only like universal language that we spoke was probably sports. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's kind of how I started to fall in love with sports. And I also played sports. I played tennis. I played soccer. 
I did cheerleading. And by the way, I had the most inner, like most injuries in cheerleading. So whoever says it's not a sport, it's yeah. just a lie. <laughs> Actually, but yeah, it's I think I just always grew up like loving, loving the game and loving the competition and the way that it brings people together. It definitely like, you know, brings families together. And it, it's a way that you can really, doesn't matter what's going on in the world. I think this can be true about anything, especially with t in today's climate where there's so many yeah. different beliefs on, you know, politics, but everybody can come together and bond and relate over, over a game. Yeah, I know. It's funny you said that because it's true. Cheerleading definitely is a sport. I read somewhere, <laughs> I believe it's way up there in terms of concussions. Uh, it is. I got it. That's how I got my first concussion. I was the fly wow. and they accidentally dropped me. We decided it was a great idea to just practice in the middle of our like high school football team. They had their practice like out on the field and then it was around a track. They're yeah. like, oh, let's let's practice this stunt on the track. Don't ask me why. Of course, we were all like, okay. And then up I go. The base got scared and moved out of the way. So that was so fun. <laughs> how many concussions did you suffer playing sports? I'm curious. I think I think that was the only one, honestly. Really? Yeah. So I'll tell you a funny story. I grew up playing soccer and okay. never suffered a concussion. And uh, probably about four or five years ago, I suffered my first watching my son's game. I wasn't watching. I received a text message. I turned around and I caught the ball right in the side of the face. Boom, went down, concussion. So that's how I got my first concussion. It was actually <laughs> watching my son's game, believe it or not. Pretty funny story. Was that was it his ball? Was he the one that kicked it? Uh, it was a player on his team who kicked it and kicked it, you know, right with his toe. And it came in like, uh, you know, at 100 miles an hour. It was really something, I have to tell you. Not 100. They were 10 years old at the time. So I'm exaggerating. You to start to wearing pads to your son's games. Yeah, I'm still being Home mocked for, from a lot of my friends. Yeah, it's the Sick Podcast, and you can follow us. You can listen to us on all social media platforms and follow us visually on Facebook and Instagram at the Sick Podcast. Now, Steve Bishotti, would that be your dad's brother? Yes. Okay, and he is the majority owner of the? Ravens. Oh, I love that jersey. I'm a all fan. Right. I'm a big fan. So uh, full disclosure, this is um, my son Anthony's jersey. As <laughs> I just showed a Baltimore Ravens, purple Baltimore Ravens, number eight jersey, Lamar Jackson. He is um, a huge, huge Lamar Jackson fan, he's, which I want to get to also in just a second. I want to start an with easy player Ravens. to be a fan of. Oh, yeah. He's amazing. The fact that your uncle is the majority owner of the Baltimore Ravens, does it make it tougher or easier for you when reporting on Ravens matters. Um, it's funny because we really cover all 32 teams the most, yeah. like, you know, we cover them all when it comes to news, but because I am based in Los Angeles, uh, I am primarily covering all West coast teams. So okay, for the majority, especially in this past season, because we were not traveling to any games, mm -hmm. it was always either the Rams or the chargers. Cause they're both here at SoFi stadium. So in terms of like, which teams I report on, I would say it's always, West coast teams. It's very rare that like I'll travel to do an East coast game. I have gone to Tennessee and covered a game there, but it was the playoffs. Yeah. So no, I've never, I've never gone and covered one of those games. So it makes it, I'd rather not probably just because there is so many other teams to cover on like closer to where I live. Yeah. But, but seeing as seeing as um, most of your work is West coast teams, yeah. And I'll ask you about West Coast teams, but I'd rather like go away from it a little bit today and ask you about a couple, but just one on Lamar Jackson, because we just talked about how yeah. exciting the player he is. You know, unfortunately, he still has doubters. And a he lot does. of people say he's a one dimensional quarterback. To those people, you say what exactly? I, can, I understand where they're coming from 100%. And I think that one of the biggest obstacles to overcome was this past season and winning that first playoff game because he hadn't won a playoff game. I think he had gone a couple of years and, you know, lost in the first round. And so I think that the biggest, uh, the biggest like feat for him to overcome and to get, you know, whatever connotation that he had, like, Oh, he can't, he can't win a playoff game. He's only a quarterback that can run. He can't, he's only a one trick pony. It's easy to say that, but then you did see him win, win a playoff game. You've seen yeah. him come in and make, you know, incredible plays and you saw him leave the game and then come back in and make, go drive right down the field in the playoff game where everybody thought that he was going to the bathroom when in fact he was actually cramping up and yeah. needing to get um, an IV. 
But yeah, so you've seen you've seen that he can do that. I think that there is a little bit of room for growth when it comes to becoming a more accurate passer and not always, you know, taking the ball and running with it. I mean, I think it's hard when you're that athletic and you're that much quicker than everybody else on the field and you know that you've got the option to just take it yourself and go and it has been so successful. I think that it's hard not to do that. But I think that you saw a little bit of like a lot of progress actually last year in terms of switching it up between being you know, taking it yourself and running versus like throwing. There was percentage wise, it was a little bit more equal and a little bit more leveled because it wouldn't be sustainable for him to do yeah. that for the next 10 years. You know, you want him to feel comfortable throwing just as much he is, just as much as he is taking the ball and running. So I do think that there is a little bit of room for growth. So I do understand where the like, yeah. critics are coming from, but I don't think that's necessarily fair anymore because he has won that first playoff game. You have seen the percentages where it's a little bit more equal between passing and running. Yeah. Um, I do think that there is more room for growth. And I do think that that also falls on having a, a number one receiver that is a deep threat, you know, that the Ravens just haven't seemed to be able to provide him with. I think yeah. that Hollywood Brown sometimes stepped into that role. You saw that Des Bryant was added to the team for at least a red zone threat. So I do think that there needs to be a little bit more of uh, a way that the offense can be spread out a little bit. As you yeah. know, it's a very run heavy offense. Then there's a lot of throwing to tight ends. There's usually two tight ends. So I think that there is a need for that deep threat receiver. And of course he needs to actually throw it to him every once in a while. So listen to this growing up because jets games were on TV all the time. <laughs> Uh, growing up in That's Montreal, crazy. I was a New York Jets fan. And I, you know, I'm not so sure if I am anymore. I've told people that I've given up on them a couple of years ago, but I, I, I still keep an eye on what's going on with them. Anyway, uh, they just traded away another I quarterback, 23 year old Sam Darnold. And a lot of people are wondering that the Jets make a good move here. Yes or no. They got a second round pick, a fourth round pick and a sixth round pick from Carolina. Taylor Bashotti, who won the trade in your opinion? Carolina I, or New York? I think that Sam Darnold won the trade, honestly. And I know that's probably not the popular opinion, but I just think that Sam was put into a really tough situation in New York with the Jets. And it kind of became one of those relationships that ended up being toxic. And I don't think that either party felt like they could continue and grow with one another. I think that by taking him out of New York, putting him in a whole different team, setting him up for success where he can kind of thrive and grow in an offense where that he actually has weapons. They can protect him. They put him in a Jets offense that did not protect him. He had hardly any weapons. The coaching organizational front office seemed to have been a mess. I think that it was one of those situations where you just kind of needed to take him out, let the Jets draft whoever they want to draft give both of them a fresh start. And I hope that I hope that the Jets end up being successful off of this. And I also hope yeah. that Sam Darnold ends up thriving and being successful because he is such a great kid and he's a leader. And I just think that he was put into a really, really tough situation in New York. Yeah, he doesn't seem devastated by it. If you take a look at social media, there was a I little know. gathering there. He was almost having like a celebration party, calling it the next leg of his career. Yeah, and I can understand that. I mean, I think that he's had everybody just, he's kind of been criticized up and down as the, that quarterback. I don't think it's fair. I think that he had a lot more potential than what he was playing with. And sure, he hasn't played, you know, phenomenal. But I do think that it'll be interesting to see what he does in Carolina. Yeah. Hey, look, I, I think Zach Wilson can go on to become a very good quarterback mm -hmm. and actually be the right move because now they get a younger quarterback. They get, you know, to start over again. They've stockpiled first, second, third and fourth round draft pick so they can insulate him and that all yeah. can be good. Uh, but to be very honest, I mean, I just, I thought they would have got more for Donald who's, who has still a very high ceiling in my opinion is still very young at 23. I agree, but it, I, I couldn't agree more, but I do also think that you have to take a look at the fact that everybody knew that they were wanted to trade him. Yeah. They wanted to trade him and he hasn't done that much since he's been in the NFL, obviously. Yeah. And so that's what you've got to look at. Uh, it's a sick podcast and go to sportbuffshop.com for all of your officially licensed sports apparel and more use code sick hoodies 15 for 15% off on all your hoodies, any NFL team moving right along. We're talking NFL with Taylor Bishotti of the NFL network. 
We were talking quarterbacks, so let's talk quarterbacks. On to Carolina we go. Sam Darnold goes there. What do you think they do? What with happens Teddy to Teddy Bridgewater? I yeah. know that's the million dollar question. And a lot of people are asking, you know, is Sam Darnold an upgrade from Teddy Bridgewater? And I love Teddy. I think that everybody loves Teddy. Everybody loves his story, just what yeah. he was able to come back from and play with and, you know, be a successful quarterback at. But I think that if you look at the two quarterbacks and you look at uh, the ceilings for both of them, I think that Teddy is a very reliable, good, consistent quarterback, but he's not, he doesn't have the ceiling that Sam Darnold has. And obviously the coaches there feel like they can do a lot with Sam Darnold. They've obviously wanted to coach him and feel like it's a perfect fit. So I do think yeah. that it was definitely the right move for Carolina. I don't think that they had that that much higher where they could go with Sam, with Teddy Bridgewater. I'll continue with the, uh, with the quarterback theme here for a couple. Aaron Rodgers, his future in Green Bay is what? Part-time Jeopardy host, part-time quarterback of the Packers, apparently. <laughs> He was great. I don't on know if you saw it last night. It was, it was great. He, he was had, great. He was really moving it along. He had yeah, like a no, subtle good. kind of like he had very like subtle energy, you know, as he's very kind of monotone, but he still had this like energy about him while doing it. And he was funny. Yeah. He was quick witted. Obviously, we all know that he's very, very smart. He had already won as a like celebrity Jeopardy guest. Yeah. So I think that it would be interesting. I'm excited to see what he's like tonight. I know that he said that when he got on his IGTV live, he had said that he was kind of nervous for it. He felt like the first episode went well, but it could have it could have gone better. And he thinks that all the other ones are a lot better. So I'm curious to see what they're what they're like. Ten finals appearances, seven Super Bowls with two teams. Crazy. One of yeah. which was at age 43 for Tom Brady. Look, I don't think he's got anything to prove to anybody, but there are all, there's always one or two people, Taylor. You know the way it is in this business, right? No one is unanimous. Do you think there's anything that Tom Brady has left to prove to anybody? No, nothing. I think that last year, you know, I don't think he's, I don't think he had anything left to prove to anybody even last year. But I think that he had something to prove to himself, and that was that he could leave Bill Belichick and go off on his own. And it wasn't just, you know, Bill and Tom together, or it wasn't just like Belichick creating a system that he was able to thrive in. He wanted to show and prove that he could do it himself, understandably so. You know, like he had been in that organization for so long. And after a while, there's, you know, things that happen in relationships where it's hard to come back from. And I think that he'll always love his time in New England and with Bill Belichick. But it's only human nature that you want to be able to prove that it wasn't just your coach that was the reason for your success. And so he yeah. wanted to go off in Tampa Bay, prove that he could do it again. And now he's like, why not? Let's just keep rolling with this. I mean, they were able to keep everybody on the team. As you saw, they've kept Fournette, they've kept Godwin, they've kept Gronk, they've kept everyone miraculously so. And so yeah. I think that he thinks that, heck, he might have two more, two more potential runs at, at more rings. Seeing as you cover teams out West, I mean, there's a lot of people think that Derek Carr can still explode and put up huge numbers. To be honest, I don't see it. Do you? And that's fair. And I, I've, I've kind of, I've gone through that same kind of like mental process this past season, just thinking about all the quarterbacks and, you know, yeah. does he have it? But if you look at last season, Derek was not the problem. You know, like that, that offense, it wasn't, it, I couldn't say that the reasons that they failed, it just seemed like there was a little bit of, you remember those final games, yeah. coaching issues. I don't think that Derek Carr is the problem. I think that there are other issues that they need to address first before him. So while we all want to sit there naturally, so, and just point fingers at the quarterback when a team isn't successful, I don't think that's fair. Let's face it. His coach talks a very good game and his return to the sidelines he hasn't lived up to those expectations. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? I think that's very fair. Yeah. All right. But so I am excited to go to their new stadium. I'm dying to see it. I've never been to Las Vegas, another place I've never been to. So I've never been to Las Vegas Hopefully I get either. sent to a game there this year. The stadium looks incredible. All right. Speaking of stadiums, the coolest stadium you've been to? SoFi. So I was lucky enough to cover all the, um, or a bunch of the Rams and Chargers games this past season where no fans were there, which I was a little bit spoiled because now I'm yeah. going to have to worry about like parking and actually not being able to run up and down the stands and go from sideline to sideline. It was so cool because you could actually hear the Hold players. Hold on a second. On Hold on a second. Taylor Bashotti doesn't have her own designated parking? Uh, are you kidding me? No. <laughs> no parking pass, nothing. Not a spot no, reserved we get parking for you. passes, but it's still like when, when you're going and parking and, you know, tons of fans are already there and, it's they're preparing for a regular game day. It still takes a lot of extra time. 
And especially just like just being like going from sideline to sideline, it's harder to, especially this year because we were up in the stands. Yeah. So we are doing our interviews like 25 feet apart, you know, they're on the, they're on the field and we're up in the stands just screaming, hoping that they can hear us. Um, but just being able to go like from side to side was so much easier and not having to, you know, deal with fans, which I'm excited for fans to see it, but it was, it was kind of nice to just have the place to yourself, but it definitely is the most incredible stadium I've ever seen. It was like, it was the, the ideal place to cover a game. Cause obviously in, on the West coast, usually yeah. we have the afternoon game. So they would kick off at one uh, Pacific time. And so they had on their like round thing that goes around the stadium. They had basically a red zone in there where they played every single game for you. So I could just sit there at 10 o'clock oh, wow. and amazing. just watch every game. It was pretty incredible. Wow. Favorite city and why? Favorite city, mm. like favorite city to visit or just um, favorite to go city see a game to visit while you're working a place where you know that I can't wait to make my way to that city because I want to go visit that restaurant. Oh gosh, that's hard. Or I can't wait to go to that city because I just can't wait to, 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 to take a walk in the city. How much free time do you have when you're working, when you're on assignment? Not tons, but yeah. you always get to go and like have a good meal and, you know, catch up with, catch up with friends if you want to. I would say, I would say, I mean, obviously I'm a little bit biased because I'm originally from Atlanta. So I obviously like going to Atlanta because I'm able to see my family. That, that makes sense. Your favorite interview to date that you've done. Hmm. How about I can give you my like dream interview? Would that, be with you know Jimmy what? Garoppolo, of course. <laughs> it, that that was going to be the next one, actually. One that you probably haven't That's done. That's going to be one like... that like just like wouldn't happen because all of a sudden I would find out that I was going to interview him and then I would just pass out. But at least every like female in America could relate to me. Jimmy Heck, G, huh? Every guy probably could too. Wow. She's Taylor Bashotti of uh, NFL Network. You're you're so good at what you do. I saw your uh, your Instagram with uh, Juju Smith-Schuster and stuff like that. It was It was amazing. Uh, are, are, is, is what are your, what are your plans going forward? I mean, I, you're, you're so good at what you do as a sports anchor and as a reporter, but have you ever thought of being an executive? Have you ever thought of, 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 uh, working front office with an NFL team or was this the goal for you? And have you reached it? I definitely have not reached it. I think that you always find yourself no matter where you are, just wanting to do more and more and more and continue to grow. I think that especially in this business, you kind of never, or you have to like try and remind yourself to like stop and appreciate mm -hmm. and be grateful for like where you are, because I know that you kind of get to where you are and then you're always looking for the next thing and you're always hoping to aspire to do more, but it's hard to, you know, be grateful for how far you've gotten and where you've come. So that's definitely something that I try and work at and try and appreciate and, you know, think about, well, five years ago, I would never have imagined that I would be where I was today. But when I'm in this moment, I'm thinking, gosh, why am I not doing that assignment? Why am I not? Why? I wish I was yeah. doing, you know, X, Y, or Z game or this pregame show. So I think it's just important to kind of remember to stay grateful and appreciate where you are. Continue to like, you know, work hard and try and reach those goals. But what an incredibly of, competitive industry that you're in. It is. It's very, it's very, very competitive. Everyone fighting for the story. And it's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's, I think, uh, I think the that, jungle like, out there. It is. And I, you know, I could never do something like that. What Ian Rappaport does, Adam Schefter, like that's, you know, that's intense and amazing. But I think that if you just focus on, you know, developing quality relationships with players and with coaches and PR staffs, and those are the most important people I think for every game I've ever covered is just yeah. the, PR, the PR staff, you know, you don't think about them, but they're the closest people to the to the players, to the teams, to the coaches. And it's always so important to like, you know, be nice to everyone and, you know, go out of your way to just kind of make a relationship with each and every person that you come across. Cause you just never know who's gonna, who's gonna be the most important person that day. And I've seen a lot of your work and I want to get back to it, but just most recently, the one with Juju Smith Schuster, you have a gift, Taylor, you have a gift of oh, making thank you. athletes comfortable and actually open up to you and maybe give you a little bit more, than they would to the next person. You, that's a gift. And by, I just wanted you to know that you have that gift. Well, thank you. That, you just made my day. So I appreciate that. 
he well, makes it just, easy. Um, he's like just a salt of the earth person. And, you know, I think, again, it just goes back to developing friendships and relationships. And, you know, there's yeah. nine times out of 10, I'm not reporting on, you know, the things that he tells me or that players tell me. You just kind of, you, you pick and choose when they want. You know, if they, they have a story that they know that everybody wants, yeah. I'll tell you where I'm going to end up going, but I'm not going to, I'll tell you other things along the way that I hope that you don't share. And you just kind of learn to, that nothing is as important. Like it's not important to leak a story. It's more important to develop that relationship. And then when like the big story comes, I'm sure that they'll, they'll give it to you. So what did you think of the juju dance? Do you think it motivated opponents? Like if you were a buddy of his, would you say to him, Hey, I love the dance. I think you should keep on doing it. Or would you say, you know, I can understand those who thinks that it actually motivates the opposition. Maybe it's not. I, a see great it. I definitely see it from both sides. Yeah. Um, he is my friend. So I am a little partial and I, I do think that he is just trying to have fun. Like, I don't think that there's anything wrong with him going out there and having fun in his free time, learning how to do TikTok dances. Heck, I'd rather have my player learning at home how to do TikTok dances and do these yeah. silly competitions that he does with his friends than going out to a club. So I think that everybody just needs to take a step back and put it into perspective a little bit. Yes, I can understand. And I totally see how, you know, front offices and other players and teams found it a little bit disrespectful that he danced on their logos. But knowing him and like coming from him, like that was never his intention. And that was not what he ever meant by doing a TikTok dance. I think that the second that it did become a big deal and realized that it was taking away from the actual game and it, be, you know, brought kind of a spotlight onto his team and teammates and coach, he stopped doing it. So I, I just think that people got a little bit bent out of shape over a silly TikTok dance. You know, like the kids just trying to have fun. I uh, Speaking of fun, I hope you had as much fun today on the SICK podcast. I did. I had so actually in this conversation. <laughs> it was amazing. I really enjoyed it. She's Taylor Bashotti, sports anchor and reporter, of course, with the NFL Network. I'm Marinero. You can listen to us on all social media platforms and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at The Sick Podcast. Taylor, come visit us in Montreal one day. Oh, I would love to. We look forward to it. We'll have you at a restaurant. Take care.